you're staying in a village full of cultists. When your friends go missing, the villagers have drugged you and they're hiding a dark secret. Every day spent here is a day closer to death. Trapped in these woods with no way to contact the outside world, what do you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death cult in midsummer. Chris here is the worst boyfriend in the world. He's at a restaurant with his friends and thinks he should finally break up with his girlfriend Danny. The guys pressure him to end it as soon as possible, but that's when he gets a call from his girlfriend screaming. She's just found out that her sister filled the house with carbon monoxide, killing her entire family. Now Danny here has no one left except for her boyfriend and doesn't realize he's planning to dump her. Months later, she's trying her best to cope with the loss and finds that her boyfriend is planning a trip to Sweden. Josh here is writing a thesis on the Midsummer Festival and the others are tagging along. But when she decides to invite herself, none of the friends are happy about her joining. She asks Pele here about where they're going and he reveals that this is where he grew up. His community is very secluded and have been practicing their secret traditions for a long time. She finds it fascinating, but when he mentions his family, she's immediately struck with grief and runs away from the conversation. Okay, this girl is going through some serious trauma, but suppressing this kind of experience is really bad for you. When you're in a fragile mental state like this, going to a new country in an unfriendly social setting is a disaster waiting to happen, and it puts you at greater risk for self-harm or a psychotic break. Now, as far as bad decisions go, Chris here is in a tough situation. He would be a terrible person if he dumps his girlfriend after what just happened, but he also needs a way out of the relationship without destroying her. Honestly, the best way to deal with this is by not taking her to Sweden. I would book her a two-week stay in a rehabilitation clinic where she's going to be looked after, and the gesture is going to appear supportive and caring. Getting her psychological help opens the door for this guy to slowly break up with her, and that is way better than bringing her to Sweden and pretending everything is fine, because it's going to backfire. Arriving in Sweden, the friends rent a car and make a four-hour drive into the countryside far away from civilization. When they finally reach their first stop, Pele here takes them over to introduce them to his brother, Ingmar. He has invited his own friends from London and welcomes them all with a bag of psychedelic mushrooms. The tourists are more than happy to accept, but Danny here is not prepared for this. She refuses at first and the boyfriend decides to wait with her, but when the group gets offended, she accepts the gift and a special tea and they all wait for the trip to kick in. Not long after, Danny here starts seeing things, but when one of their friends mentions their family, it triggers her and the girl starts to freak out. She walks away, trying to suppress her memories and enters a restroom to hide in, but when she sees her dead sister in the mirror, it becomes too much. Running into the forest, she stumbles deep into the woods and blacks out. She wakes up, finding her boyfriend standing over her and he tells her she's been unconscious for six hours. Okay, clearly she should not be doing drugs right now. The active chemical in psychedelic mushrooms is called psilocybin, which links different regions of the brain that wouldn't normally talk to each other. Now what's interesting is that medical researchers use psychedelic mushrooms to treat depression and mental illnesses with great effectiveness. During a five-year trial at John Hopkins, 80% of their patients showed a significant drop in symptoms of depression and anxiety. But doing a clinical study and taking drugs out in the field with friends who don't give a f about you are completely different things. Her trauma will come to the forefront of her mind and out of her control. Before letting it get this far, she needs to think for herself and refuse the drugs. They walk further into the wilderness until they finally reach the village, entering through this huge wooden archway. Their friend introduces them to the rest of his family and everyone is extremely kind, giving special attention to Danny here. The Midsummer Festival begins and the villagers start dancing in celebration. The group is enjoying the show when suddenly the boyfriend here gets kicked by one of the girls. He sees her smiling and decides he wants to join in, leaving his girlfriend all alone. Pella here notices the girl is uncomfortable and gives her a portrait he drew for her birthday. Her boyfriend didn't even remember and she thanks him for the present but the man tells her to keep it a secret. Okay, this is a really nice gesture but there's a lot more here than meets the eye. This picture is extremely detailed with a lot of shading and would take a long time. He definitely didn't draw it on this blanket because there's no hard surface and they've only just arrived. This sketch was premeditated and it tells us he either likes this girl or there's something else going on here. The portrait has two runic symbols on the bottom of the page. We can't expect her to know what these are, but if she asked, he would have told her that they mean journey and rebirth. Now instead of being flattered, she should be creeped out, because by looking around the compound, we would find a very disturbing tapestry with the same symbols as the ones on this page. It tells a story about a girl who falls in love and trims her pubic hair to feed to her crush. After eating it, he's placed under a love spell. 
This is already cause for concern, but what's interesting is that the symbol on her birthday present is inverted. Historically, when these runes are inverted, it gives a dark or negative meaning, so this message literally reads, a bad journey to rebirth. That's not the kind of gift I would want for my birthday, and if she had dug a little deeper here, she could have figured out that this guy's a lot more dangerous than he appears. They're taken to the dormitories, where their friend Pele explains that his people see life in different seasons, and there's no one in the village older than 72. Asking their guide why, he says they get executed and shrugs it off. They think he's joking, but they're going to learn very soon that he means every word. The next day, the villagers gather for the Ate Stupa ceremony, and the friends have no idea what to expect. The elders are taken to the top of a massive cliff, drawing blood to place on a runestone which has a journey symbol on it. Danny looks up and sees the woman step forward as she realizes what's about to happen. The group is horrified as they watch this woman fall to her death, bashing her face on the rock below. The girl is beyond traumatized and looks around in a daze as the other tourists start to panic, but the villagers all look calm. Turning back to the cliff, she watches as the old man jumps and breaks both of his legs but manages to survive the fall. The villagers start wailing and crying as a small group approaches the elder and bashes his brains in with a giant mallet. Okay, this is getting a little out of control. All of this culture stuff is fine if we're simply observing old traditions like wearing stupid frocks and moccasins. But if throwing two senior citizens off of a cliff is culturally acceptable behavior, then I'll bet they're willing to do a whole lot more. These villagers didn't even flinch at watching the woman get her face smashed in and now we need to be thinking about what else is on the menu. Because if we look back far enough, Swedish culture can get pretty f***ed up. During the medieval ages, Vikings would sometimes sacrifice someone to Odin by pulling their ribs out from their back and placing their lungs over the top. They would also throw people into wells and if they never came back up, then their gods would answer their prayers. Even in Viking funerals, a servant would be drugged, tortured, and killed so they could die with their masters and kings. At this point, I'm thinking any one of these Swedish cultural traditions are all on the table, and if it's me, I'm not sticking around to find out which one comes next. But there is one tradition that's worth learning from, and that's because as brutal as Vikings were, they kept a great hair routine. Did you know that 2 out of 3 guys will experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time they're 35, and the best way to prevent hair loss is to do something about it while you still have hair left. Today's sponsor, Keeps, offers generic versions of the only two FDA-approved hair loss products out there. You may have tried them before, but probably never for this price. With an easy online doctor consultation and delivery straight to your door, you can keep your hair and keep looking like Ragnar Lodbrok and you don't have to raid and burn Lindisfarne to do it. Prevention is key. Keeps treatment typically take between 4-6 to six months to see results, so it's important to act fast. The sooner you start using Keeps, the more hair you'll save. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash how to beat or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash how to beat. You won't need a dang gel for these prices and thank you to Keeps for sponsoring this video. Sickened by this ritual, the British tourists begin to leave but they're stopped by a village leader. She urges them to stay, explaining that the ceremony is an honor for her people and it was their choice to die. Everyone walks back to the village, but Danny here is starting to crack. She's been avoiding all thoughts of death, and now it's staring her in the face. Her boyfriend, however, is inspired. Back at the dormitory, he tells his friend that he's decided to write his college thesis on the heart of people just like him. Josh here isn't happy about this, but there's nothing he can do to convince him out of it. Later that day, Pele here goes back to the dormitory where he finds Danny is packing up her things. She's horrified by what she saw and wants to leave. Getting her to calm down, Pele here tells her he understands what she's going through because he lost his parents when he was young. These people accepted him as family and wants her to feel like she has a family too. Okay, this is starting to become a pattern. Pele here has gone out of his way to make her feel accepted and on the surface that looks like a good thing, but it's also exactly what would happen if you were being lured into a cult. They like to trap people in shame cycles and convince you that anything outside of their family will only cause you pain. She's being made to believe she can't survive on her own and needs this group to replace the family she's lost. This is highly manipulative behavior and we need to stay alert to more cult-like patterns because there's a lot more going on here. When the British tourists wanted to leave, the village leader interrupted the ceremony to convince them to stay. It's also extremely weird that they didn't warn anyone in advance about what was going on. This means they would prefer visitors to feel trapped in a situation they can't control and make them emotionally dependent in their decision making. Under the surface, there's enough dishonesty here to convince me this is not just culture, and we need to leave the compound by any means necessary. That night, everyone is sleeping in the shared dormitory when this girl gets up and sneaks across the room. 
she crouches by the boyfriend's bed and places a rune underneath it, unaware that Josh here is watching her. The next morning, he shows the rune to his friend and finds out it's used in love spells. That's when their friend Chris arrives and Pele mentions that a village girl has a crush on him and wants to mate with him. She's finally old enough for breeding according to Harga society, and it takes Chris here by surprise. But strangely, he seems interested in the idea. Okay, this guy is crazy. It's always nice to be appreciated, but he should really think this through, because getting involved with a local girl who's probably way too young to be considered legal is not a road he should go down. In Viking culture, girls were considered ready for marriage by the age of 12 to 15, so for Chris to even consider this proposal is absolutely terrible. Now even if he were to go through with it, this culture does everything together. They eat together, sleep together, kill their grandparents together, they probably even mate together. So unless you want to include the whole family in fun time activities, don't do this. He's also brought his traumatized girlfriend along for the ride, and this place has zero privacy, so it's literally the worst idea in the world. Across the village, Connie here is packing up to leave when a villager tells her that her boyfriend has already left and the car will be back to pick her up. She doesn't believe him and decides to leave on her own, with no idea that's the last time she'll ever be seen again. Danny finds her boyfriend and tells him that one of the British tourists have gone missing, but he's more concerned about getting information for his thesis. He asks if the Harga people have problems with inbreeding in such a small community and the man tells them they often need to invite outside people to mate with. Okay, this is seriously concerning, because now we know why they're trying to keep us here. Honestly, this community has not thought this through. If all they want were these people's genetics, then they should have the orgy first and kill the old people after they leave. There's no good reason to bring them to the Ate Stupa ceremony because it freaks everyone out. If the world knew that a village in Sweden was pushing their grandparents off of cliffs and breeding their children, there would be a lot of intervention. Anyone who leaves this place is putting their lifelong traditions at risk of exposure to the outside world. The fact that this hasn't happened yet means they must have a way of ensuring that those who come here will never talk. Earlier, Pele Hair made sure that Danny didn't leave when he saw her packing. Since we don't know what they'll do with us after the celebration, it gives us enough reason to think our lives might be in danger and we should leave the compound without telling anyone. With this much deception and gaslighting, I would tell them nothing and just leave during one of their festival celebrations because it guarantees the whole community will be there and will be able to look for the car keys and Pelly's belongings to escape. Now we also need to plan on the possibility that we can't find the keys or get a cell phone signal when we're this far away from civilization. Compared to the United States, large areas of Sweden have no coverage at all, and these guys are in Halsingland, which is known for its dense forests. It's also one of the largest countries with the second lowest population density in the European Union, so the chances of you finding any help out here is very slim. The best thing to do is follow a paved road and follow it north. There's also more likelihood to be a phone signal on a main highway, and you'd be able to call emergency services. Josh here wants to learn more about their holy books and talks to one of the village leaders, discovering that each version is painted by the village's inbred oracle and interpreted by a leading member of the community. Surprised, he asks the elder if he can take a photo of the book and is told it's strictly forbidden, but that's not going to stop him from getting what he wants. Later that day, an angry villager runs across the field and starts screaming at Mark here, but he has no idea why. The man explains that Mark was peeing on an ancestral tree and has insulted their entire village. His friend tries to make him understand that it's sacred to his people, but Mark here thinks it's not a big deal, and he has no idea he's just made a dangerous enemy. Everyone in the village prepares for lunch, and Danny here realizes that both British tourists are now missing, but one of the villagers quickly comments that they were taken to the station. Mark here notices that the man he pissed off is still glaring at him from across the dinner table, but that's when Chris here suddenly finds a pubic hair in his food. He doesn't realize that this is only part of their secret mating ritual, and he's been selected for breeding. Mark here is suddenly invited by a village girl and he leaves the dinner table to join her. Okay, when people are going missing, you shouldn't let any of your friends out of sight. Mark here is being unexpectedly lured away by a pretty girl, and after pissing on the village's ancestral tree, it's very unlikely that he's going to be rewarded for it. This looks suspicious, and Mark should not be going anywhere alone. We can't trust these people, but it's important we don't let them know that. Pretending to cooperate is essential, because the more they believe we're willing to accept and join their cultural traditions, the easier it will be to exploit that trust and gather all the information we need to write a thesis so we can all get the f out of here safely. That night, Josh here sneaks into the temple where they keep their holy book and takes photos of the pages inside, but he doesn't notice that someone is behind him. Turning around, he's startled when he sees a stranger standing in the doorway as someone else hits him in the head and knocks him out. The stranger approaches and we quickly realize that his friend has been murdered and this guy is wearing his face as a mask. The next day, they notice that more of their friends have gone missing and are told that the village's holy book has disappeared from the temple, but Chris here assures the leaders that they didn't do it. 
Okay, we can't ignore the pattern here. There are now four people that have gone missing without a convincing explanation. This is beyond coincidence now, and what's most important to realize is that if anyone was going to disappear, it definitely wouldn't be Josh. The whole reason they are on this trip is so he can study the community and write his thesis. It tells us these people are dangerous, and now we have proof that these tourists aren't just leaving the compound, they're being killed. Mark was lured away by this woman and had his face removed for the oracle to wear as a mask. And even though they don't know this yet, if my friends had gone missing, I would be looking for them throughout the entire compound checking every single building until the truth was uncovered. If they did this, not only would we find Mark being worn as a mask, but they would also discover that the British tourist is being viciously tortured in the chicken coop, and their friend Josh has been turned into a garden ornament. That's not even the worst of it, because it's about to get f***ing medieval after this. Now, for students writing a college thesis, these guys are seriously bad at picking up the details here, because even before people went missing, there were signs everywhere that this place was not safe. They passed this bear in a cage, and nobody even said a word, and they didn't even notice that the wall paintings are full of bears being set on fire. This should be freaking them out. There's also paintings of people drawing blood to sacrifice themselves, and exploring details in their cultural art is enough information to tell them that their lives are in serious danger here, and if they continue to participate in their culture, it's only a matter of time before someone will get tortured and killed. And that's exactly what's about to happen next. Outside, the girlfriend is given a special tea for the May Queen competition with the other young girls of the village, and they go to form a circle around the maypole. But when she looks down at her feet, she realizes that she's been drugged and panics. The competition begins, and they all start dancing. Danny is even enjoying herself, but the girls suddenly stop, which causes two dancers to fall down and get eliminated. They change their formation, and the dancing gets faster as more of them drop out of the competition. As the dancing continues, the boyfriend is offered a cup of water with special properties. He hesitates, but when he sees the girl who likes him, he downs the entire glass, and it's going to cost him everything. Okay, the woman just told him this drink is going to help break down his defenses and make him more open-minded. Now, generally speaking, these are good qualities to have, but the problem is, I don't see anybody else being offered this drug water, and that means that whatever is about to happen is not something we would be okay with in our normal state of mind. This is a huge red flag, and if I were him, I would refuse the drug to make sure my judgment wasn't impaired. Now, even without drugs, we're already in an environment that makes us highly susceptible to influence, because when you're looking at this as a cultural activity, then you apply moral relativism. It might not be right to you, but it's moral for them because it's a part of their culture, so you end up suspending your own moral judgment and accepting the group's opinion. Adding drugs to the mix makes it next to impossible to protect ourselves from being influenced here. We don't know if they're going to do something terrible to us like we saw at the Ate Stupa, and being drugged takes away your ability to judge the situation. The drugs are kicking in hard, and as Danny here dances, she's finally able to forget about her trauma for the first time since it happened. When the last two girls fall, the whole village congratulates her as she's crowned this year's May Queen. She's pushed onto a platform, and all the women carry her to a giant dinner table in the middle of the compound. She's seated at the head while her boyfriend sits with the others, and he starts to lose control as the drugs begin to take effect. He sees the girl Maya leave the table and can't keep his eyes off her. The village elder announces that as the May Queen, Danny must bless the villagers' crops alone, and she can't bring her boyfriend with her. She gets in the carriage and is taken to the farmlands, leaving Chris behind. Okay, I don't like where this is going. The last time someone sat at the head of a table, they jumped off a cliff. We've also been here for several days and haven't met a single woman who has been the May Queen before. Just like there's no one over the age of 72, this could be very bad news for us. But there's actually a silver lining here because right now, Danny has more power and control over her life than she has had at any point since her family died. She's the May Queen, and now that they actually need us to participate for the rituals to continue, I would try to hold the entire celebration hostage and leverage his power to look for opportunities to escape. I would demand that if they want me to bless their crops, then they must let Chris here join me. These people deeply respect their traditions, and would likely do what was asked in order to preserve them, but we can also think outside of the box, and use this power as a means to escape. I would try to get my hands on the drug they gave Chris, because if it makes you this f***ed up, we could slip it in one of the villagers' drinks or force them to take it. Now, this is no ordinary drug. This guy can't seem to resist whatever he's told to do, no matter how hard he tries. And this is exactly what happens when you're on scopolamine, which is one of the world's most dangerous drugs, because it makes you do almost anything you're told. That makes this the perfect solution for a getaway, because if we can get our hands on these and find a way to trick the villagers into ingesting it, then we can get them to do whatever we want, whether it's to hand over the keys to the car or follow the leader off of the cliff. 
As soon as Danny is gone, a girl approaches her boyfriend. She's made a path of flower petals leading straight to him, and he realizes he's supposed to follow the path to mate with the village girl. He's led to a room filled with naked women, and on the floor is Maya, who's waiting for him. Too stoned to resist, he gives in and makes the biggest mistake of his life. Later, the girlfriend comes back to the village and is told to go to the elder's house, but she hears noises coming from a nearby building. They tell her not to be concerned, but she ignores their advice and goes to investigate. She approaches the door and it's locked, but when she looks through the keyhole, she's horrified to find her boyfriend is cheating on her. She can't stomach what she's just seen and turns around to puke, as the village women rush in to comfort her. Now she's lost everyone she's ever loved, and they take her back to the dormitory to calm her down. The boyfriend finally comes to his senses and realizing what he's just done, runs out of the building. Embarrassed, he looks for someone to hide, but that's when he sees his friend's leg sticking out of the soil. Panicking, he runs inside of a chicken coop and checks if anyone is following, but when he turns around, he's shocked to find the body of the tourist hanging from the ceiling. Taking a closer look, he realizes the man has been turned into a blood eagle and his lungs are still breathing. Suddenly, a villager appears and blows powder in his face. Drugged, he collapses to the ground as the elders prepare him for their final ritual. When he wakes up, a woman tells him that he's completely paralyzed and can't speak. The elders announce that they will now sacrifice nine people for their last ceremony. Four villagers, four tourists, and one person that Danny, their new May Queen, will have to select personally. She's given the choice between a villager or her paralyzed boyfriend, and feeling betrayed by all that he's done, she chooses her boyfriend to die. The villagers bring all of the bodies to the temple to prepare them for the last ritual. In another house, the man removes the organs from this bear and puts the boyfriend inside of its corpse. Heavily drugged, with no way to escape, he's placed in the temple along with the other human sacrifices and can do nothing but watch as the building is set on fire. Screams of pain erupt from inside of the temple, and the villagers begin wailing in traditional celebration. But Danny here looks on and smiles, and she now realizes that she has everything she needs right here, and that this is where she belongs. But what do you think? How would you be midsummer? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How to Be playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.